Well, uh, it is a little bit past seven o'clock, so we're gonna get started for tonight. Uh, in our uh, last section, we're going into the last section, uh, or last topic, uh, for our several week now study through First and Second Corinthians. Uh, and in this last section, uh, the topic is how to think uh, as a leader. Uh, these last four chapters of Second Corinthians are some of the most influential uh, scriptures that I've read in terms of how I go about, how, like, uh, let me rephrase. Uh, back when I was uh, just starting in the ministry, I was uh, newly a licensed pastor and I was working as the youth pastor up in Ohio. Uh, Andre and I went through a two-week training out of California, out in California, and uh, during the two weeks, we went through First and Second Corinthians in in pretty heavy detail. Actually, we might have spent the entire two weeks in Second Corinthians. Um, and these last four chapters were very influential for me, uh, and I'll, I'll kind of expound on why that was as we go through them. Uh, but let's go ahead and pray to get started for tonight. And then we will dig in. Tonight we're going to be in chapter 10. So uh, chapter 10 this week, chapter 11 next week, and then 12 and 13. And then that will complete our uh, study through these two books. Uh, let's go ahead and pray. Lord, we thank you for this night that you've given us, God. We thank you for your word, which is uh, just so perfect for uh, teaching us and bringing us to maturity and following you, Lord. I just pray that as we study your word tonight, your spirit would instruct us and teach us uh, in your name. Amen. All right. So yeah, 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 10 is where we're going to be tonight. And this last section uh, of 2 Corinthians chapter 2, these last four chapters, I'm sorry, no, I'm all mixed up. The last sec this last four chapters of 2 Corinthians, that's what I was trying to say. Um, some scholars and historians believe that these four chapters are actually uh, their own letter and actually are not part of the same letter as the rest of the book of 2 Corinthians. There's a few reasons for this. One is that at two different points in 2 Corinthians, Paul refers to a letter that he had written earlier, uh, which was a letter... Uh, in chapter 2 and in, verse, and in chapter 7, he refers both times as to a letter that was really difficult to write. It was very harsh towards the Corinthians. Um, and um, that he that he almost regretted for a time writing, but, but ended up not regretting it because after he had sent it and they had been challenged and convic convicted by it, the effect was that they... Uh, you know, that, that they that they grew and they and they matured uh, and they received the the correction. Um, now, the reason why that letter that he's referring to probably isn't First Corinthians is because the tone of First Corinthians is not harsh. It's not it's not harsh like that. Um, but if you study Second Corinthians all the way through, and I know we've been jumping around, but if you just read Second Corinthians from beginning to end, you'll see a big tonal change between chapter 9 and chapter 10. Uh, because chapters 1 through 9 in 2 Corinthians, if you just read them straight through, uh, are, you know, corrective and, and Paul's teaching some things, but they're also, you know, pretty pretty praising of the Corinthians and, and talking to the Corinthians like, you know, you are some people who have started to really get it and I can see you growing. But then you get into chapter 10, and as we're going to see tonight, Paul is really kind of laying into them, um, these last four chapters have a lot of sarcasm. Uh, they're kind of harsh, um, not in a you know ungodly way, of course, but in a way that's, that's pretty blunt to the poor attitudes and the disobedience that the Corinthian church had. So it doesn't really follow with the tone of, of what came before it in this book, because up until chapter 10, it sounds like, well, the Corinthians seem like they're doing pretty well, but then in chapter 10, he really starts laying into them. Um, and so for that reason, and some of the other ones I've already described, um, it is believed by some historians and scholars that actually 2 Corinthians 10, 11, 12, and 13 are a separate letter. And those four chapters are, in fact, the letter that Paul was referring to as the letter that he wrote through anguish and tears, and it was hard for him to write to them. Um, and so 
if that is the case, then actually the chronological order of these books would be the book of 1 Corinthians, and then 2 Corinthians 10, 11, 12, and 13 as a, as a letter, and then the third letter being 2 Corinthians 1 through 9. Um, it's interesting, you know, to understand it that way. Uh, and it will explain a little bit of the tonal shift here because uh, you will see Paul being, you know, loving, but very, very blunt, um, almost kind of harsh, and well, not almost kind of harsh, pretty harsh in, in some areas, uh, because he's confronting a lot of really bad attitudes um, that was happening in the Corinthian church, which I'll expound on as we, as we go through it. But uh, before we start this chapter, um, one of the things that I'll just bring back to your memory, and we've talked about this in earlier parts, but uh, one of the there, there were a lot of issues happening in the Corinthian church. One of those issues was that after Paul had planted the church in Corinth uh, and lived there for a year and a half and helped it grow and, and mentored and, and discipled a lot of those people, once he moved on, you know, Christianity at this point was really exploding through the Mediterranean, and so you had a lot of new converts. And you had a lot of uh, new teachers and, and things popping up. There were, you know, there were these new pastors and teachers were sort of growing up out of this widespread movement uh, that had been started by, you know, the twelve apostles and uh, others who were sent out to evangelize the area, right? And so, uh, what was happening now in Corinth was that all of these new sort of up and coming uh, successful pastors and teachers were really giving a lot of attention to Corinth because Corinth was rich. Okay. They had, they were, it was a wealthy town. And so they were getting a lot of attention. And as Paul points out in this chapter and, and in other places, some of these teachers were, um, false teachers. They just, they really weren't what they were, what they were representing themselves to be. Not necessarily because they were teaching things that were wrong, although some of them were, but it was because they were, they were coming and ministering to the Corinthian church for the wrong reasons. And this is one of the things that Paul's going to point out, right? So sometimes you have a pastor or a teacher, this happens even today, who, you know, the content of their message and what they're teaching and preaching may be biblically correct. You know, the content is, is, is right. Uh, and it might even be a good message. But the heart and the motivation behind why they're preaching or why they're ministering to a certain group of people could be actually sinful motivation. Namely, I'm going to come pastor you because you're rich and I actually just really want your money, right? Um, and that, that goes on today, sadly, as we know that it does. Uh, and it was no different even just a few decades after Jesus uh, went back to heaven and, you know, the Great Commission began and, and the apostles started to go out and spread the gospel through the world. Within, you know, a couple of decades, that was already happening. These new pastors were jumping up and, and they were targeting towns that they could kind of extract money from them for preaching to them. And so this is one of the things that Paul is confronting. And he has confronted it at other points throughout the books, but he's going to get really harsh about it right now because... He's going to spend these chapters pointing out to them um, essentially what Paul is going to be teaching the Corinthians here. There's a lot of things he's teaching them. One of the themes is how the Corinthian church can know the difference between a godly leader who is walking in obedience and serving them with the right motivations and the right heart and someone who isn't, right? So Paul's helping them. He's really going to come at them pretty hard, but, he, but he's doing it. For the, for the purpose of teaching them to know the difference between him and some of these other, uh, he'll call them so-called apostles or these so-called super apostles, which is, I think, his sarcastic term for them. Um, and so he's saying, and so that's what we're going to see. Now, because that's what Paul's doing and he's showing the Corinthian church, here's how you know the difference between a true godly leader who is in it for the right reasons and is serving you and serving the Lord and someone who's really just in it for themselves and just looking for the money and the glory and the prestige. Um, because that's what he's doing, then for you and I, uh, uh, it serves a couple of functions. One, 
it helps us look at modern day pastors and preachers and and, and right now I mean we're like in, uh, in, in the heyday of pastoral ministry you might say because um, I mean think about how many pastors sermons you can watch online uh, without ever having to actually know them or go to their church right so the potential for a pastor to have influence far beyond his particular church or, or her particular church or city or state or whatever uh, is, is really there and so um, also there the abuse of that is, is going on as well it really is and, and we've seen this so uh, firstly these chapters will help us identify how can we know a godly biblical pastor and teacher from one who's not um, because sometimes it's not very obvious um, unless you're looking for the right things. The other thing, and this is what I really want to focus on as the topic, as you can see, is how to think as a leader. What I really want to focus on is for you and I, uh, at, if you're either in church leadership, for example, I already am, um, some of you already are, uh, but also some of you, I think, are called to leading in the church um, or have a heart for it. And this is just, these are going to be some really great chapters to teach us how should a church leader think? How, how should someone who's leading in the church think? What should their motivations be? Um, and how do they really love and express their heart to the people that they're leading? And these things we can also learn because as Paul's going to teach, okay, here's what an authentic leader looks like. Then we as leaders can look and go, okay, I need to match this description that Paul is is giving and not match the description of some of these other, as Paul will call them, so-called apostles. He doesn't do the air quotes, of course, because quotation marks did not exist in the original Greek. Um, fun fact. Um, but anyway, you'll see the sarcasm there. So, uh, all right, that's my kind of preface. Let's go ahead and dig in. There's really two points that I want to pull out today from chapter 10. And I'm just going to read them to you now so we know what we're looking for. The first one we're going to see in verse 8. And it's this point that um, I believe that the one of the first key steps in being a leader in the church, and I, I, mean, I think a lot of, let me back up, I think a lot of the points we're going to learn in these chapters apply to all leadership of all kinds, whether you're a boss at your business, um, if you're a parent, if you're a pastor, um, Certainly, the application is, is pretty widespread. Um, just so I don't have to keep repeating it, I'll just tell you right now, my focus will be specifically on people who are leading in the church um, or who feel called to lead in the church. Okay, so that could be the angle, although, you know, it's a given that these principles will also apply in, in other uh, avenues and, and, thing, and areas of life. Okay, so... Um, Okay, that being said, I think one of the most important things for a leader to start with is to really know their calling. Because as you're leading, as you're ministering, uh, your calling is going to be challenged a lot, both directly and indirectly. And we're going to see in this chapter how the Corinthian church was effectively really challenging Paul's calling. Uh, to the point of saying, maybe you're really not this great apostle, but everybody thinks you are. Um, it's not an ego issue for Paul, um, but it is important for other reasons, which, he'll, which we'll get into. Uh, so as a leader, I would say one of the first things you've really got to have solid is that you know your calling. Okay, so that's the topic for tonight in chapter 10. Uh, and so here's the two points we're going to see. First, in verse 8, uh, here's the first point. Any authority... God gives you, okay, this is very key, any authority God gives you is for you to build up his people, not tear them down. We're going to see that in verse 8. So we're going to get some more, but I just want to say it again. Any authority God gives you is for you to build up his people, not for you to tear his people down. I know that might sound obvious and simple. But it's really something you got to keep in mind. Um, okay. The second point we're going to see uh, is in verse 12, 13, uh, and 18. And that is that your value and your influence as a leader is found in Jesus' calling on your life and not 
and how you compare to other leaders, okay? So those are the two things we're gonna be pulling out of chapter 10 tonight. So with that being said, let's dig in, okay? So verse one, um, here we go. So Second uh, Corinthians chapter 10, verse one, says, now I, Paul, appeal to you personally by the meekness and gentleness of Christ, I, who am meek when present among you, but am full of courage toward you when away. He's being sarcastic there. He's quoting them, just so you know that, right? So he says, I, who am meek uh, among you, or uh, when I'm with you, uh, but bold, right? Or have a lot of courage toward you when I'm away. This is an accusation that we're making. You're going to see that uh, down some more. He says, verse 2, I beg of you that when I am present, I may, I may not have to show boldness with such confidence as I count on showing against some who suspect us of walking according to the flesh. For though we walk in the flesh, we are not waging war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but have divine power to destroy strongholds. We destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God and take every thought captive to obey Christ, being ready to punish every disobedience when your obedience is complete. Look at what is before your eyes. If anyone is confident in Christ, that he is Christ, let him remind himself that just as he is Christ, so also are we. For even if I boast a little too much of our authority, which the Lord gave for building you up and not for destroying you, I will not be ashamed. I do not want to appear to be frightening you with my letters. For they say his letters are weighty and strong, but his bodily presence is weak and his speech of no account. Let such a person understand that what we say by letter when we are absent we do when we're present. Not that we dare to classify or compare ourselves with some of those who are commending themselves, but when they measure themselves by one another and compare themselves with one another, they are without understanding. Now, I'm going to pause for a minute. So in a nutshell, here, if we go back to look at verse 1 through 6, um, Paul is, starts right off the bat with just calling them out for what they're saying. Essentially, the Corinthian church or people in the Corinthian church are saying, look, Paul writes these, these amazing, powerful, bold, courageous, corrective letters to us. But when he gets here, he's not that impressive. That's what they're saying, right? But they're taking it one step further than just he doesn't have as much of a commanding presence in person as he does in written form. They're taking it one step further. They're actually implying that he actually does not have authority from God, uh, that God's calling on his life maybe is not legitimate, because if it were, then when he were there presently with them, um, then they would be able to see it, right? Um, and so Paul is uh, fighting that right off the bat and just saying, I'm going to be really clear here. Um, we do have authority from God. There's evidence for those things. And people who think that we don't have this authority in this place from God to come and to teach and instruct and even to discipline you uh, will, will, will learn otherwise when we show up, right? So he's, he's really challenging their arrogance uh, and he's challenging their misunderstanding of how to know who is a godly leader and who's not, right? In other words, one of the things they're being tricked by, and this is, again, still very commonplace today, is just because a pastor or a teacher could come to them and, and they could just, they could speak really well, you know, and their sermons were just, you know, they would hit that nerve or whatever, and you would go, wow, what a, what a good word, you know, and, and, uh, uh, and, you know, this other guy over here, like, he's not that good of a speaker. Paul's essentially challenging them and saying, that's got nothing to do with whether or not this guy or that guy is called or has any authority in the Lord, right? And so Paul is just starting off really strong and saying, look, I know what God's called me to, um, and I can prove it, <laughs> right? Um, and so verse two, right, I mean, or verse one, right? And he says, 
he's being sarcastic, but as you can see, because he repeats it down uh, in verse 10, right? He, he's being sarcastic by taking on this description that they're saying, right? So he, he says, I'm, I'm appealing to you by the gentleness of Christ. Me, you know, the one who's humble and not that big of a deal uh, when face to face, but so bold when I'm not with you. Um, me, right? So you, you can kind of see that. But he's challenging them directly. So I think that you also see Paul's willingness to um, to challenge, uh, you know, just some nasty things being said, but not do it in a way that uh, is, you know, is elevating himself. But really what you see Paul doing is elevating God and saying, the calling that I have is not because of how great I am. I'm not called as an apostle. I don't have spiritual authority over you just because I'm good at speaking. I have these things because God has given them to me and you'll know them. You'll know that I have them when I show up and you see it happen, right? Uh, so he's, he's willing to back up uh, the authority that God has given him uh, by demonstration of that authority when he arrives. But he's telling them, and this is, I just want to come back to verse 8, right? Is he tells them, he says, even if I boast, verse 8, even if I boast a little too much of our authority, he's not just talking about himself, but, you know, his team, right, of ministers and the other guys that come with him and support him. And, you know, like earlier in the letters, he talks about Titus. So that's what the hour, you know, he's talking about the, the people that minister alongside him as they journey through and, and, and uh, minister to the churches. He says, even if I boast a little too much of our authority, which the Lord gave me for building you up and not for destroying you. So what he's saying, he's saying, listen, you know what I don't want to do? Like, God may have given me this place of spiritual authority. But I recognize that God didn't give me that spiritual authority so I could, I could show up and slap you around, right? He's saying, God gave me that spiritual authority so that I could come and I could build you up. So that I could encourage you, so that I could teach you, so that I could help you be stronger, so that I could serve you, right? Um, and he says, I don't want to use that to tear you down. I don't want to use it to, to lay into you the way that I'm currently having to. I don't want to use it that way. I would rather be using it for the purpose that God gave it to me, which was to build you up. Okay. It's so important for us as leaders to just always remember that because one of the things that is a very common mistake, right, for all leaders, I mean, in any position, is that as human beings, power and authority can go to our heads, right? So remember, as a leader, uh, any position that God gives me or you, he never gives us any position of authority or power for the purpose of elevating ourselves or for the purpose of laying into somebody or for the purpose of correct, you know, or, or, you know, or, or giving anyone a hard time or, 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 you know, uh, oppressing anyone. Certainly not for that. Right. Uh, all authority, uh, and position that God gives you, he gives you in order for you to serve someone. Right. So key for a leader. Um, you know, uh, this might sound, um, well, it's not, it'll sound the way it sounds. This is why I believe that uh, in a group, the leader is always the one who should sacrifice the most, um, be first in, be first out, right? Um, no one should be under more pressure and under greater burden of sacrifice than the leader. That's part of the leader's job. It's part of what God's called them to do. So as a leader, you never use your power and your authority or your position that God's giving you uh, to elevate yourself. In fact, what you do is you use that to serve others, which actually brings yourself lower and more humble. And of course, you do that partly because you have the confidence in God that God is the one who will provide for you and lift you back up. And this is exactly the example that Jesus gave his disciples, right? When Jesus strips his robes off and he goes and he washes the disciples' feet, he says, look, a servant, that's the disciples, is not greater than the master. That's Jesus. He says, so then, if I have done this for you, right, like I've given you an example. So Jesus is saying, this is the way leadership in the kingdom of God works. Uh, and this is the way that it looks. Uh, leadership in the kingdom of God is not you sitting on a throne. 
and it's not everyone honoring you, and it's not everyone lifting you up and saying how great of a pastor you are or whatever. No. Leadership in the kingdom of God, you being a leader looks like you stripping down and washing people's feet. That's what it looks like. And that's partly what Paul is pointing out there in verse 8. Um, but verse 12 now, we're going to go into the second point that I want to pull out tonight. And that is this big, 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 big issue uh, that we, ha- we have really in all areas of life. Um, but I'll speak as a pastor and, and uh, as you guys who are church leaders uh, know, this is, can also be the case. Uh, this big issue of comparison, right? Um, you know, you, you know, I could, uh, for example, I could, you know, preach whatever sermon I think on Sunday morning, and then, you know, someone shares some clip of some other pastor on Facebook later that week. It's like, oh, it's such a good word. And immediately in my spirit and in my emotions, I'm, I'm feeling tempted to, like, compare myself you know, to, you know, whoever this guy or girl is, uh, you know, preaching at some, you know, awesome church and everyone thinks they're the greatest thing since sliced bread and, uh, right. And there's that temptation to compare or to even think, well, maybe, maybe I'm not as good of a leader. Maybe God hasn't really even called me because I'm not anything like this or that. Uh, but starting in verse 12 here, Paul makes it just super clear that anyone who validates the call of God on their life by how they compare and stack up to somebody else who's been called by God. Um, that A person who does that is just completely without understanding. So let's start in verse 12 again. He says, Not that we dare to classify or compare ourselves with some of those who are committing themselves. Now here's one of the things that was happening. Remember I told you, that these other pastors and teachers were coming to Corinth because Corinth was rich and Corinth could pay them. And they could go and they could preach in Corinth and they could walk out of there a rich man, right? Um, One of the things these people were doing is before they would get there, they would send letters ahead, basically going, this guy is the greatest pastor ever and you should have him come and preach and uh, give him money because... Uh, he's just going to change your life spiritually. You know, these are things that were happening. So that's what Paul says. He goes, look, we're not, Paul saying those people are commending themselves, right? Those are the pastors, those are the teachers. They are sending you letters of recommendation that they wrote about themselves. Uh, and he says, look, we're not trying to classify or compare ourselves with those who are commending themselves. He says, but, But when they measure themselves by one another and compare themselves with one another, they are without understanding. In other words, what he's saying is they don't get that the calling of God on your life has nothing to do with how you stack up against somebody else. Verse 13 says, But we will not boast beyond limits, but will boast only with regard to the area of influence God has assigned to us to reach even you. For we are not overextending ourselves as though we did not reach you. For we were the first to come all the way to you with the gospel of Christ. We do not boast beyond limit in the labors of others, but our hope is that as your faith increases, our area of influence among you may be greatly enlarged so that you may preach the gospel in lands beyond you without boasting of work already done in another's area of influence. Okay, so Paul is putting some big challenge here. If you're reading between the lines there, here's what Paul is pointing out. He's saying, listen, it was Paul who came to Corinth when no one else had come to Corinth, right? Paul led the way in bringing the gospel into the city. He gave the city a year and a half of his journey, right? He stopped and stayed there for a year and a half, uh, sharing the gospel, uh, bringing people to a saving knowledge of Christ, building up the church, training up their church leaders, getting their church ready and established to grow and continue, right? And when he's talking about other areas of influence, what he's saying is these other pastors, these other teachers and preachers and these guys who are commending themselves, they are swooping in, trying to steal all the credit for work they didn't do. 
And Paul's not really mad about the credit. What he's, what he's saying is, Paul doesn't care about the credit. He's just pointing out, I don't care about the credit, but they clearly do, and that's one of the ways that you know that they're false teachers. Because I am not a false teacher, and I don't care about the credit, but they do. And that's one of the signs. They do care about the credit. They are trying to come in, and they're trying to take credit that they haven't built for. And he's saying, look, what what I, this is what he's saying in, in verse 16. So that we may preach the gospel in lands beyond you without boasting of work already done in another area of influence, right? What he's saying is, look, our our goal in spearheading the ministry into Corinth and, and planning this church and growing you all spiritually was not so that we could get credit. It was so that you could then go and do in other cities the things we did in yours. In other words, Paul's saying, we're trying to reproduce the work of God that is in our lives into your lives so that you can do the same for others. We're not trying to get credit back for ourselves. We're trying to push the gospel and the salvation of Christ through the world. These guys over here, all they care about is credit and it's not even theirs. They're trying to take ours. And this is one of the ways that you know that you shouldn't be listening to them. I don't care how good their sermons are. They're false teachers, right? Because the character and the behavior, that's a big thing. It's a big thing. Okay, so that's kind of the breakdown of what Paul was just saying. Let's look at verse 17. He says, Let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. So key, right? So key. You're basically saying, look, if you're going to brag about anything, brag about God. <laughs> if you're going to talk about how great someone is, talk about how great God is, right? If you're going to work for someone's glory, work for his glory. Which is what Paul's doing. It's what his team's doing. And it's not what these other guys were doing. Okay, verse 18. For it is not the one, this is, this is the key. It is not the one who commends himself that is approved. But the one whom the Lord commends. Okay. So that's the picture of what's happening in chapter 10. We're going to see that roll into chapter 11, which we'll get to next week. Um, so again, tonight, as, as uh, leaders or as people who are wanting to grow in leadership, um, the big takeaway from chapter 10 is that as a leader uh, uh, and as God is calling you to leadership, one of the first things that you just have to come to a, a solid confidence in is the fact that God has called you. And he has called you. Um, your, your calling is not uh, validated by how well you stack up against someone else doing the same job. Uh, your calling is not uh, in order to raise you up or elevate you. It's actually to, to cause you to be a greater servant uh, to people. That's, that's the point of the calling, right? And so um, I'll, this has been so key for me. And I'm, I'm, and I'm really glad that I studied this deep. Uh, and it was, it was really another teacher really blessing me, right? Uh, 2006 is when I went away to uh, this training uh, uh, in a church out in California. Uh, for two weeks, and I didn't, I didn't know we were going to be studying. I just knew it was a training for young leaders, and so I went, and we, we hit Second Corinthians hard uh, for two weeks, and um, you know, two or three times a day, and uh, yeah, chapter ten and on just really hit me deep, and it's been for now, you know, fourteen years of pastoral ministry. Uh, it has been uh, something that I regularly go back to to check myself. And to make sure that my heart's in the right place, right? Uh, and I'll tell you this quick story, and and then we'll wrap up for tonight. Um, I'm also looking. Let me make sure. Um, so, if anyone's got questions, now would be a good time to to throw those in the uh, comment thread, and I'll try and get to them before we uh, close up. Um, I lost my train of thought. What did I talk about? Oh yeah, quick story before we go. Okay. Uh, recently, uh, I had a friend of mine, uh, back in Ohio, 
who is himself uh, going uh, through the, the process right now to become a pastor. And so he called me and said, hey, I'm starting this process. Uh, I know you've been doing this for a long time. Uh, what advice do you have for me? Uh, right? And I mean, it was like that wide open. And I was like, you're getting your pastor's license and your question is just simply, what advice do you have for me? I go, are you really giving me that much of a green light to just talk about whatever advice comes to mind? He goes, yep, I just want to know. What's the first thing that you think I need to know? And I told him, I said, uh, I remember right now, I was actually walking through the store, uh, shopping for Andrea's Christmas present. This was like November or something, December. And, uh, and he calls me and I remember walking through the store and I stopped for a minute and I go, yeah, here's, here's the piece of advice I have for you. I said, you need to pause for a couple of days and be really sure beyond any doubt that God has called you to be a pastor. I said, because from this point forward, your, your calling is going to be constantly challenged. People are going to challenge it. Circumstances are going to challenge it. And you need to be able to stand firm and say, I hear what you're saying. I see that situation. I'm hearing your challenge, whatever. But I know what God said. I know what God told me to do. Right? Um, and I said, that's... I said, because that's one of the ways the enemy is really going to mess with you. And that's not just true for pastors. That's true for any church leader, right? Anytime that you step into a leadership role, well, here's what's going to happen. The enemy and uh, ill-willed people around you are going to try to undermine your calling and say, I don't, I don't, you know what? I don't think you should be a pastor because you said something that I didn't like. Right or something like that, right? Uh, it's usually not that simple, um, and people are going to challenge you and undermine it, and you have to be able to stand and go, no, no, no. I know God's calling on my life. It's not based on how I stack up against somebody else. Um, it's based on what God has spoken and what God's created me to be, and I'm fulfilling this calling, not out of my desire to meet your demands. Or your expectations. I am fulfilling this calling out of my desire to be obedient to God and what He's called me to do. Uh, and so, uh, you and and you can see how the conversation goes from there. So important. Uh, so yeah, that wraps up for our thing for tonight. Uh, we will be continuing next week. Um, so again, tonight's topic was knowing your calling, chapter ten. That's the big takeaway. You really know your calling, you know why you have it, you know what the purpose of it is, so that it's not easy for someone to just pick it apart and and uh, and fill you with doubt, right? That's, uh, as a leader, the one thing that you cannot have, I mean, you'll have moments of it, but the thing that you really cannot let into your life is doubt. You've got to know, this is what God's called me to do, and I'm going to do it, because I'm the one, I want to be obedient to Him, right? Um, next week, we're going to be in chapter 11, uh, 2 Corinthians, and the topic next week is going to be about demonstrating true leadership. So that it's going to carry some of the ideas that Paul has shared in this chapter. Those are going to be carried forward into chapter 11, where he's going to give them more ways as to how to know what's a real leader. And, you know, we'll just put it real simply, what does a real leader look like and what does a fake leader look like? Okay. Uh, which for us as leaders, very important to learn and you know that. Okay. Any questions or comments? I do not see anyone, but that does not mean that you cannot put them some up there after the video and I'll get back to them. All right, let's go ahead and pray and we'll close up for tonight. Uh, Lord, we just thank you. God, we thank you for the fact that you place calls on our lives. Lord God, that you have not only created us, but you have created us with a purpose. And that purpose is good. And that purpose is fulfilling and it's rewarding, Lord. And so I pray uh, right now against anything uh, in our lives, anything that the enemy will want to throw at us, Lord God, that will try to rob us 
of the goodness and joy and beauty of your purpose in our lives. Lord, in and, and, and whatever ways you have called us to lead, Lord, I pray that we would just be stirred up uh, and challenged, Lord God, to not sit on that calling, uh, but to do something with it uh, so that your glory would would be expanded through the world, Lord God, and your people would be ministered to. Uh, so, Lord, I just pray your uh, continued revelation and blessing over us tonight and this week uh, and all these things. In your name, amen. All right. Well, that wraps up for tonight. You guys have a great night, and we will be back again next week. All right.